it's not working. Biology with Mr. B. Biology with Mr. B. That's me. Right, I'm keep. I'm keeping that start. That's one of the best starts I think I've ever done. Uh, hi, hello. Um, I am doing a little video to go through the topic of adaptations and classification. It's a paper two topic, so will only come up in the paper two exam. Um, and this is generally suitable for anyone who's already learnt this topic at GCSE, whether you did it in year nine, ten, or eleven, doesn't matter. Let's roll. I'm going to try and get through five key ideas. Uh, the idea of communities and the organisation within them, the key words, things like competition comes in there as well, interdependence. We'll look at different types of factors that can affect communities and ecosystems, so biotic and abiotic factors and what's the difference. I'll look at the required practical that's from this topic, which is using quadrats to sample. Uh, to sample sort of uh, populations, abundance and distribution. We'll look at adaptations that organisms can have. In particular, I'll show you the three sort of key ideas that have got to be nailed by any student, as well as classification. Linnaeus versus Carl Vos's uh, more modern system of classification and how that kind of links to um, evidence we have for evolution as well. So, presumably my tablet works really nicely. I'll just double check I'm still recording. I am still recording. Let's roll. So I've already drawn you. I've drawn a human person, an individual. And if I was to consider all the human beings within the same sort of ecosystem, within the same place, well, that would be the population. So all the individuals of that species all together. So what I'm just doing now, I'm kind of just organising yourself. So if I think bigger, so if I get, you know, the population of humans that is in whatever ecosystem we're looking at, could be your house. And of course, it's just randomly gone slow for me. Um, and then I add to the other organisms. Don't laugh. This is going to be a cat. Their whiskers, an eye. Um, four legs and a tail. Yeah, that's good for me. That's really good. Let's do actually organisms I can draw now. I'll do a tree. Okay, I said I can draw. But I think it's obviously a tree. It's not a good tree, but I think it's a tree. So I've got different, obviously, species here now. But I've got all the individuals of all those different species, all the living things within my ecosystem. And that is my community. All the living things within my ecosystem. So an ecosystem must be more than just the living things. An ecosystem must be... You know, all those living things, I've got to try to draw that blinking cat again. Um, cat, four legs, tail, tree. Oh, that's the worst. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> so it must also be all the non-living things that these living things interact with. So maybe a river. Draw an arrow to show the flow of water. And maybe even a mountain. Wow, it's a mountain, everybody. Yeah, that's a mountain. Sure, why not? So that's my ecosystem. It's that interaction between all the living and the non-living things. So if I show you a slightly better version with Fluffy the Rabbit, this definition of ecosystem is the big definition to learn here. Not community, not population, not individual. The definition we need here is ecosystem. The interaction of a community of living organisms, so all the living organisms in that area that are interacting, and their interaction with the non-living parts of their environment. So Fluffy the rabbit's the individual. All her rabbit friends together make her, that's the population of rabbits. That rabbit with all the other living things within that sort of habitat where they're surviving. So in this case, it looks like a woodland. And that's the community. But then all the living and dead things and non-living things, dead things. I don't think river's dead, but it's all the non-living things that have been interacted with. That's your ecosystem. Cool. OK, so within that ecosystem, within those living things, the communities, there is a lot of different 
competition. Competition drives organism. Competition drives evolution. It's very good to have competition. Because if you have competition, it means some organisms won't win. And it means those organisms who don't have very good adaptations, those organisms who just aren't the best at surviving, they probably won't. Which means they don't get to reproduce. It means they don't get to pass down their genes to their babies. Because why would you want a species to pass down bad genes to their baby? The only species alive that does that is humans. Because modern medicine is amazing. And we all have a chance. Well, all have a chance. The majority of individuals of humans, especially in uh, first world countries, have a chance to survive and reproduce, no matter how rubbish their genetics are. Those of you listening to this, reading and watching this, uh, wearing glasses, for example. If this was the wild, are we all back being cavemen or whatever came before that? Well, I wonder who the saber-toothed tiger's going to get. Probably the one that can't see it coming. No. Either way, plants, animals, we still very much do compete, even, even humans for that, but we're just a bit more complicated because we're so social. Plants compete for what they need to survive. So what they need for photosynthesis, like water. Light, space, obviously, if they're all compact, then obviously, you know, they are just haven't got enough space to get that water, light, and nutrients. Um, and they're competing for that all the time. Animals obviously don't need to compete for light because we don't photosynthesize, but we do need to compete for food. We do compete for mates. Again, think about the diagram I've got here, butting heads. The winner will get all the females in that group. Lucky bugger. And of course, compete for territory. A lot of birds of prey do that, compete for territory. They'll have their own set territory that they'll stick to. Obviously, the bigger the territory, the more food they might be able to have. So they might compete to get more territory. Technically, we don't compete for water. Or at least, it's certainly not a marking point if you say animals compete for water. They don't really like that in exams. It's too... Uh, like, do we compete for water when there's a giant river that every organism can access? You know what I mean? It, it, it's very, it's a bit too, a uh, bit too niche. Whereas plants always compete for water, always, no, no real exception. There's some competition. Interdependence, my hopefully final keyword from this communities plant, this first part of plant. Within a, any community, obviously there are food chains and food webs. Because we are so dependent on other species for our food, and for some individuals, for shelter, pollination, seed dispersal, all those ideas, if we remove just one species because of a disease, it can affect the entire community. But this is in, in, in perspective. If I was to remove Dory, the blue tang fish, if I was to remove blue tang or blue regal, Oh, I'm forgetting now. Either way, that's not important. If I was to kill that cute little fishy there, well, the shark would have less food. So we might find the population of sharks decrease. Or the sharks might not decrease. They may stay the same size, but now they're eating more clownfish and turtles, which means the clownfish and turtles decrease in size. And if these guys decrease in population, obviously the number of like algae and zooplankton might increase in population but then if these guys increase in population then eventually these guys will also increase in population which will mean the shark will have more food so it will increase in population which means these guys will have be eaten more so decrease in population then these guys obviously if there's less of these these guys will start to increase again and it's a never ending blinking story because we are all dependent on one another for food and a lot of organisms are dependent for shelter a lot of plant species are dependent on insects to be pollinated and for their seeds to be dispersed. If we remove just one species, it doesn't just affect the person above it, it affects every single species in that community. That's interdependence. Dependent between species. Inter means between. And hopefully, oh, not too far, hopefully, if everything stays in balance, all the environmental factors stay in balance, those population sizes, although they'll fluctuate up and down every year, they'll roughly stay the same. 
nothing changes in the environment, the population should stay the same, shouldn't it? But sometimes that environment doesn't change. Sorry, bleh. sometimes that environment doesn't stay the same. Sometimes it changes. And that's where we have the idea of factors that can affect population sizes in the community. And those factors can be non living, abiotic factors, or they can be living factors, biotic factors. Here's a nice big table of, of them, really. So, abiotic, look, these are all factors that can affect sort of plant levels, um, therefore, obviously, the amount of food animals will have. So, light, temperature, moisture, soil pH, wind levels, CO2 levels, and oxygen levels. These are all non-living things that can affect whether plants and animals survive. The biotic factors are the living factors, so availability of food. Bear in mind, guys, all food is living, isn't it? If you eat a plant, well, that plant was alive. Everything we eat has come from a living place. Even if that's microorganisms making the protein inside your, uh, your corn-based sausage. It's still from a living thing originally. New predators arriving who might outcompete you or eat you. New pathogens causing disease. They're living bacteria, viruses, funguses, new pathogens. And again, yeah, one species outcompeting another. You know, you can be, it doesn't have to be a predator coming and eating you. It could be just another type of herbivore, another type of species on your level who's just better at catching food than you are. So, you get less and you might die out. The abiotic and biotic. If it's a factor that's not alive, it's an abiotic factor. If it's a factor that is alive, it's a biotic factor. Right. Practical time. Oh, nice little picture. Let's go back to my lovely tablet. We can use. Oh. Hello, you shouldn't be on my son that screen. What are you doing there? Hopefully, I think that's gone. Let's try. We can use a square frame to help us measure abundance of species and measure distribution of a species. This square frame is called a quadrat. <laughs> oh, it's bless, it's lagging a bit, isn't it? Being a bit slow. Here we go. I'll keep using this unless it definitely dies, in which case I'll just go back to be powerful. So let's imagine you wanted to know or wanted to estimate the number of bluebells in a field. Now, you could just go out to your field and just count every single bluebell in, in one go, but God, that'd be mind-numbingly boring, wouldn't it? So let's imagine our field is 50 metres by 100 metres. Not dissimilar to the school field on the top field. So 50 by 100 metres. And let's say I decided to put quadrats down in 10 different places. One, two, three, four, five, six. Nine, ten. So ten quadrats. Each quadrat, by the way, it will be a meter by a meter because that's nice and easy to count to count, isn't it? So straight away, guys. First bit of maths. If I've got those dimensions, I can work out areas. So the area of this quadrat is obviously one meter squared. One times one. The area of the field is 50 times 100, which happens to be 5,000 metres squared. Therefore, I can fit 5,000 quadrats into that field if I chose to. I've only done 10. I've only done 10. Doesn't sound very valid. Doesn't sound like enough repeats, really, for an area that size. But I've only done 10. So first question is, where have I put those quadrats? I've put them down in random places. That doesn't mean I've closed my eyes and thrown them. That is ridiculous. How's that random? 
You can close your eyes all you want, but you're in charge of how hard you throw it. You know, you don't just, if you launch it as hard as you can, you can guarantee it, you definitely won't be sampling right by your feet, will you? Likewise, people have said, oh, you can thin people around, close their eyes. No, absolutely not. That is not random. Because you are still in control of that throw. To randomly place a quadrat, you want to use a random number generator. To generate coordinates. The trees hit like an X and Y axis. To get a coordinate between 0 and 50 on the X axis. Get a coordinate between 0 and 100 on the Y axis. And put your quadrat where those coordinates go. That's randomness. Just raising that last bit, sorry, the random number generator bit, just so I can make room to draw a table. Come on. Oh, that's good. So, let's say I did, so I did 10 quadrats. This is my table. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I'm trying to count the abundance of bluebells, so I want number of bluebells in quadrat. So I don't need any units for these, by the way, which is quite good. So let's say the first one I got two, then I got four, zero, 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 four, eighty-two, uh, two, two, zero. That would do. Right. So what I can do from that is I can work out the mean number of bluebells per quadrat. And I can do that by adding up these 10 numbers here and divided by 10, because that's how we get a mean. So 2, 6, still 6, 10, 92, 94, 96. So it could be. 96 divided by 10, but it's not going to be 96 divided by 10 because of that idiot there. That quadrat has clearly been put down in just this giant little patch of bluebells. It does not fit the trend of the other nine results. That is the anomaly. And you do not include anomalies in your mean. So we almost remove it completely from the me, and instead we get 2, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Couldn't add 4 then. So there's 12, and we don't have 10 quadrats anymore because we've removed number 7, so that's actually divided by 9. And 12 divided by 9, this is where I have to get my phone, because I do not know that top of my head. It always 1.3 recurring, so I'll just put 1.3. For one decimal place. So in every quadrat, there's an average of 1.3 bluebells per quadrat. And I know that I can fit 5,000 quadrats in my whole field. Because the area of the quadrat is 1 meter squared, the area of the whole field is 5,000 meters squared. So my estimate. of bluebell abundance in whole field is 1.3 times 5,000, because 1.3 is number per quadrat, and 5,000 is how many quadrats can fit into the area, and 1.3 times 5,000 6,500, apparently. That's if I've typed that incorrectly to the calculator, of course. So that is how we can use random sampling to estimate abundance. How many? It's not the only way. You can use a quadrat. You can use it to measure distribution. So let's say we let's say we're investigating um, blue rails again. I've still got my field, it's still 50 metres by 100 metres, but I don't need to write that down, I don't care about that now. What I actually care about is the tree. 
let's say you were asked to work, look at, you know, look at the distribution of bluebells um, near and around that tree. You want to know, does the population of bluebells change like the further away from the tree you get? So what you do is you put a quad trap down. Excuse me. What you do, repeat myself, is you put a transect down. And a transect is a straight line. And because you're not daft, you'd probably actually put, you'd probably at least put three down because you want some. There you go. Three transects, straight lines that in this case are coming out of that tree. Because we might want to see, does the population of bluebells change the further away from the tree you go? So in this case, you actually put the quadrat down, not randomly. You put it down at regular intervals. such as every two meters. So if I did this, and I did it, I've done it three times, I've got three transect lines, because I want to, I want a little, I want a mean, I want to, you know, I want valid data, and needs to do repeat. Otherwise, it might just be anomalous if I only do it once. That does, by the way, mean I have had to randomly select where I put my transects. That wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't just put a measuring tape down for fun. You'd have to randomly select around that tree where you actually put it. So there would need to be at least one coordinate uh, being measured using a random number generator. But there is still an element of randomness to make sure it's not biased. So in this case, let's say I had, so I've got, um, I don't need a quadrat, I'm independent variable, my independent variable in this case is distance from a tree. Obviously, that would be in meters. I'm going to go two, four, six, eight, six meters. And then number of bluebells. And I'm going to do that three times. I'm going to want a mean as well. Okay. I'm not going to bore you by writing in the one, two, three, and then getting the mean. I'm just going to fill in the mean as if we did it on all three occasions. So yeah, the quadrat's two meters there, there, and there as well. So let's say at two meters, there was, there was none. There was none again at four meters. Oh, there was a couple of bluebells on average at six, four, eight, and an average of eight to ten meters. So what this data is showing us is that, yes, there are more bluebells. further away from the tree you go. So that could be, obviously, you know, we can apply our science now. If they might actually to explain that pattern. The explanation would be, well, yeah, of course it's increasing. Because the closer it is to the tree, the more competition it has for light and nutrients and water from that tree. And the tree's obviously going to win that competition, isn't it, compared to a bluebell. It's going to have bigger roots to get more water and more nutrients. And obviously it's going to be much taller, much more leaves, so it's going to get more sunlight. So I hope that kind of makes sense. We can use, yeah, we can use quadrats for random sampling. But we can also sample along a transect line at regular intervals to look at distribution. So just summarise that. So to get quantitative data, you need to sample. There's random sampling using quadrats. You always want a large number of samples to make your data reproducible. Helps you identify and remove anomalies like I did. And that gives you a more accurate mean. If you make it random, it means you remove bias. I always say this story. I once had a kid called Lloyd. And literally, I just gave the quadrats out and I let them do their own methods. And his group just decided to put them down wherever they want, not random. So, of course, what did Lloyd do? He went out to the school field. They were sampling daisies. He saw a giant patch of daisies up near the far corner and went, daisies, and literally ran there and put the quadrat down 10 times where those daisies were. So, whereas most people who did it randomly, their estimate of daisies on the whole school field was about 500, his estimate, was five billion. <laughs> so 
yeah, need, needs to be random. And then, oh, too far. Sampling along a transect, a straight line of regular intervals. That helps you spot patterns, distribution. But you still need to put the transect line down randomly to avoid that bias. So there's someone quadrating along a straight line, quadrating along a transect. There you go, do you require practical? Okay, number four, adaptation. So an adaptation is a feature that allows an organism to survive in the environment which it normally lives. So something about you, a characteristic about you, that helps you to survive where you live. The three classic examples, because in an exam, by the way, they can give you any organism they want. They will tell you some information about it and you'll be expected to explain how those features help. The three classic environments they choose are cold environments, warm environments and dry environments. So in a cold environment as an animal, what do you want? You want small ears. Smaller the ears, smaller surface area, you lose less heat. You want thick fur because it traps a layer of air which acts as a really good insulator. You want lots, lots of fat because that also insulates and prevents heat loss. And especially if you're, you know, if you're a prey or predator animal, you're going to want white fur to camouflage in with all the snow. And then if you know, if you're the polar bear, less prey, less seals will see you coming, so you hope to get more food. Or if you're a, um, you're a prey animal, like a, an arctic bunny, an arctic rabbit, do Google them, they are adorable. Um, again, having white fur hopefully makes you blend in with the, the surroundings so the polar bears and, and such don't see you. If you're an arctic animal, you tend to have a small surface air to volume ratio. That means you've got big volume, so you're probably quite chunky, quite fat, but you're more compact as well. So small surface air to volume ratio. You won't have long limbs of that. Now, obviously, I've not talked about adaptations of the polar bear being a predator here. I've not talked about the sharp claws, big teeth, you know, to help rip open those seals. Um, and I've not done that because in this box, all I've talked about it is, is the adaptations of any organism living in the cold. If it was a specific example of adaptations to do with polar bears, and I didn't mention coldness, then obviously you could put in the predatory um, adaptations as well. But if it says, you know, how they survive in the cold or in the Arctic, then, yeah, you're going to want to stick to cold weather adaptations. So warm weather. Oh, too far. So a oh, classic little camel living in a desert. But this, this works again for all desert based animals, really. Uh, you're going to find long limbs, long legs, long neck, big surface air to lose heat. So like lo uh, large ears as well. Uh, fur will be really, really thin to allow, allow heat loss. Very little body fat. So to again, to with less insulation and camels. Oh, how many, I can't believe how many GCC kids in their year 11 exams write that camels store water in their humps. That is just so ridiculous. Right, I don't, I mean, I appreciate not everyone's ridden a camel in their life, but you, you feel the hump, like, it's solid, guys. It's solid. It's clearly not water. If it was water, it would be sloshing everywhere, wouldn't it? The hump is fatty. But you can metabolise fats into water. You can use fats instead of um, and metabolise them in respiration. And obviously, product of respiration is water. So that's why people think that it's to do with water, but only because the fats get turned into water by the by the, by the uh, camel. That surface to volume ratio idea, they have a large surface to volume ratio. So in other words, they'll be big, but very, very thin. The volume will be small, but the surface area will be large in comparison. Final classic ex adaptation example is plants living in the dry environment. Now, what do they do to reduce water being lost? They have a really short stem, so there's less chance for the water to leave, so small surface area. Their leaves are usually very fleshy, so they store lots of water in those leaves. Uh, they usually have a nice little waxy coating, waxy cuticle on the outside, acting as a barrier, wax is waterproof, so water can't leave that leaf. 
and the roots tend to be really long, really big surface area for the roots to take as much water as possible. The exam technique. Clearly, every, every kid in the country is going to be able to state adaptations. Small ears, big teeth, things like that. And therefore that gets no marks whatsoever in higher tier exams. You get marks for explaining why it helps the organism survive. So don't just say short stem, say short stem to reduce the surface area so less water can leave. You get marks for the explanations. Don't just state it. Right. Final bit. Well, of adaptations, at least. Some organisms live in ridiculous environments. I mean, unbelievably extreme environments. These organisms are called extremophiles, which is just the best name that we have at GCC Biology. So if you're looking at an organism that is surviving in a really extreme environment, then it's called an extremophile. So bacteria that live in deep sea vents, so massive pressure at the bottom of the sea, but also huge temperature. These are underwater volcanoes, so 400, 500 degrees. Yet those bacteria are thriving, loving that environment. There's also no light down there, which is pretty extreme as well, isn't it? They're surviving, they're thriving because they're adapted to. Their enzymes will be adapted to that temperature. The optimum temperature of their enzymes in those bacteria will be 400, 500 degrees. They're adapted to that environment. They are extremely fine. Right. Very last thing then. Classification. There were two scientists involved in classification for you guys at least. Cole Linnaeus sort of mid 1800s Swedish scientist, and Kol Vos, who is a 20th century scientist. Kol Linnaeus was one of the first who would group organisms by based on what they look like. And he thought there were two kingdoms, animals and plants. And he was wrong, but he did give us his lovely, uh, he gave us the classification system we still use today. That we classify into kingdoms first, then phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You do need to know the order of that off the top of your head. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I would recommend a mnemonic to learn that. King Philip came over for good spaghetti. I'd recommend a mnemonic. Personally, I wouldn't recommend that one on the board. But this is being recorded, so I have to be clean. Generally speaking, the more personal you can make a mnemonic, the ruder you can make a mnemonic, the better. Because you'll remember it. So don't, go, don't go wrong, don't start writing out swear words in your exams or in your books. That's not good. But if it's something you can remember, great. If it's something you and a group of mates can remember, as long as you're not offending anyone or you know hurting anyone's feelings or anything, great. This is about exam grades. Do what you can do to get those, to get them. And eventually, like me, you'll just learn kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So you do it again and again. Now, I know this says domain at the top, but that wasn't Linnaeus. That was Cole Vos, which we'll talk about in a second. So the only other little rule you need with this, as well as along, well, apart from learning kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, is how you go about writing names of species. Whatever organism you have, you write their name using the binomial system. So we don't have to write everything, we just write the genus and species. But there are rules in terms of how you write them. The genus is always the first name, so it comes first. The species is the second. The genus must have a capital letter and the species must be all lowercase. So Homo with a capital letter, sapien, all lowercase. And if you handwrite them, it must be underlined. If you print them, they must be in italics. So in exams, 
clearly for most of you who handwrite, you will underline those names. We'll just escape out of this for a second and I'll just oh that's the wrong one. Let's see if this remark this tablet's working and I'll show you. Just an example of that. Oh it's really not happy. This <laughs> is not happy at the minute. I'll give up with that, never mind. So, for example, I know that, you know, if I, my, my favourite fluffy animal is obviously cat. I know their kingdom is animalia. They're chordata, the vertebrates. They are for obviously mammals, mammalia. I know that a cat's, the domestic cat's order is uh, carnivora, the carnivores. Their family is called felidae. Their genus is felis. And their species is catus. <laughs> So you would write their name as 